I'm going to get a neck ache looking at this side of the building. It's only, there's, there's like one or two faithful in the far distant marches of this side. Do you want us to We're the right way? No, 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 no. Stay where you're at. You're trying, I know you're trying hard to get back on that side, but it's not going to work. Yeah, well, Pastor said that way more people can sit over there, so that's why I'm here. Yeah, I know. So, uh, um, you did a very good job. I'm doing uh, good. Excellent. Uh, well, anyway, um, where I was at? All right. Um, I drank a lot of coffee before the service, and so if I get easily distracted, that's why. This week we're looking at the rise of the beast, and we see in Revelation chapter 13, verses 1 through 18, we see, uh, well, about the beast and who this character is. We've looked extensively already at the Antichrist, about prophecies concerning him in Daniel and um, 2 Thessalonians. We've uh, already studied him extensively, so we're not going to look as much in depth at that today, but more at uh, the rise of the Antichrist. And um, we see it detailed in chapter 13, verses 1 through 10. Um, verses 1 through 2 describe his appearance. And as I stood upon the sand of the sea, um, no, I mean, uh, and I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. So, as John is standing upon the sand of the sea, he sees this monster rising up out of the sea. Good morning! And uh, this beast is, really is a very hideous beast. If you think about, if you, bear, if you try to get in your mind a picture of this beast, it has seven heads, ten horns, it's got a body like a leopard, a mouth kind of like a lion, paws like a bear. Hey, uh, Fuji Anthony, they got Sunday school next door if you guys want to head. One of these days, i got to sneak in and see what goes on in Sunday school next door. It sounds fun. Um, this beast is a hideous beast. This beast is described in what chapter? Thirteen. Thirteen. You're listening good, Michael. Um, I, that, I actually phrased the question badly. This beast is <laughs> described in what chapter of Daniel? 7, 8, and 9, excellent. Uh, especially in Daniel chapter 7 is another reference to a beast, a hideous composite beast. Daniel chapter 7 is another view of what chapter of Daniel? What chapter of Daniel parallels Daniel chapter 7? Good question. Daniel chapter 2. In Daniel chapter 7, we see uh, four uh, different beasts, the final being a hideous composite beast. In Jan Daniel chapter 2, we see four different nations, the final being a composite nation. Well, we see uh, concerning this beast that it, it rises up out of the sea. Basically, it's a Gentile. Uh, the sea often refers in the Bible to nations and uh, the nations, the Gentiles. Some say the Antichrist is going to be Jewish. I would very, very strongly say, almost pretty much dogmatically say, based on Daniel chapter 7, 8, 9, that the Antichrist is Gentile and is almost definitely Greek or Greco-Roman. Yes? Is the reason they suspect him to be Jewish because the Jews are going to maybe think that he's the Messiah? Yeah, they'll kind of think he is, but really, um, when he comes to Jerusalem in the halfway point and commits the abomination of desolation. The Jews reject him wholeheartedly and then he goes after the Jews to kill him. And the Jews have to flee, as we saw last week. It's so, interesting how many nations are see themselves as a messianic nation. It's unreal. Like I, I was listening to, I don't know even know what it was, but it was on a secular radio program a while back. It was a documentary of Messiahs. And 
almost none of them have Jewish heritage in all of the, of the different mess, Messiah figures that the Gentiles follow. And of course, this one's going to be one like none before him. And so I think it, you know, I think we can just see from, from our narrow scope of Antichrist that we've already seen how much he can be Gentile. So you're yeah. absolutely right. Yeah, I definitely agree with you. Especially since you agree with me. That always helps, right? Well, um, You're awesome. That's awesome, Chris. Daniel chapter 7 awesome, describes Chris. this beast as a little horn. Daniel chapter 8 describes him as a horn again. Daniel chapter 9 describes him as the prince of the people that will come. Daniel's chapter 7 and 8 refer... Um, Daniel chapter 8 refers to this Antiochus Epiphanes as being a picture of him. Antiochus Epiphanes being Greek. Um... <laughs> Daniel chapter 7 mirrors Daniel chapter 2 which would be referring to the Roman Empire and then becoming the Antichrist Empire and Daniel chapter 9 the reference to the people of the prince that will come that people would be the Roman people so this Antichrist is basically Roman and um, or perhaps Greco-Roman slash Greek which technically the Romans came from the Greeks if you look far enough back um, they think that the Romans came from Trojans who fled Troy, who went and hanged out, hung out over along the Tiber River and formed Rome after, basically it was formed by Romulus after his brother jumped over a ditch and he killed his brother for jumping over his ditch. And um, that's just an aside extra, but uh, basically Rome, Roman culture was very much so Greco-ish culture. It, uh, so, really, the Antichrist is going to be Roman, Greco-Roman. The long and short of it, really, from a Jewish perspective, is, is that he's a Gentile. He's a Greek. He's, he's, not, he's an unclean figure. Would especially be the emphasis of him being Gentile is that he's, not, he's, not, he's an awful person. Um, we as Gentiles are awful people who've been grafted into the vine and made worthy to be part of the family of God. But um, we see about this beast having seven heads and ten horns. This is referenced in Daniel chapter 7, verses 7 through 8, 19 through 27. It describes this beast, which is the Roman Empire, but is also describing the beast itself. And we see that this beast receives his authority from the dragon. The Antichrist is empowered by the devil himself. Verses 3 through 4 describe a false resurrection of the Antichrist. And I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? <clears throat> Interesting. Jesus prophesied that they would not receive him, but the one who would come in his own name, him they would receive. This false resurrection um, shows really the beast is a false Christ. He is the Antichrist. He is, um, you know, he's basically a mem member of the pseudo trinity. The devil forms kind of his pseudo trinity with himself as the fake father. The beast as the fake son and the false prophet will be introduced to later in this chapter as the false Holy Spirit. It's interesting um, how this false trinity works. The uh, true son came to give glory to the father. The false son, the beast, seeks just to hive the glory up for himself. And the dragon doesn't mind that because when people aren't worshiping Christ, they're worshiping him. So he's, he's fine with that. This, uh, this false son, this Antichrist, has a false church, the great whore of Babylon, we'll see in Revelation chapter 17. And um, this beast will deceive the world through lying signs and wonders. It seems that this, when this beast is slain, as it were, the people will all marvel and wonder. And I don't think it's the, that the Antichrist will actually be completely killed. It'll just be looking like he's killed, it seems. It says, as it were, wounded unto death. So I think that it's going to look like he died, and somehow the devil's going to work some kind of false miracle or something and basically deceive the world. It's amazing how people in their rebellion against God will refuse to believe the clear 
clear signs of the resurrection, but will gladly receive a false, fake resurrection. Do you think that has to do with the delusion? Um, I was actually thinking about this morning. Uh, this very possibly could be the strong delusion which is referenced in 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 through 10. If this were, this would um, be very interesting because it would allow for many people to be saved after the tribulation and it would follow in the timeline of the beast not receiving his great prominence until the three and a half year period. Um, it would be something interesting to delve into further. We see about the beast, there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. Who gave the beast his mouth? I find it interesting that God allows the beast to say all these things and to do all these things. And the beast isn't doing this in his own power. God's the one who allows him to do this. And was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name in his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. The beast is blaspheming God and cursing against him, but who died for the beast's sins? God did. God did. You're right. Jesus died even for this awful man, the beast, but in his ingratitude and in his pride, the beast is uh, fighting against God. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. So basically at the three and a half year point of the tribulation, the beast appears to be slain, he rises again, and all of a sudden, the whole world basically follows after him. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of the life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. This beast, for 42 months, for three and a half years, will have power, but his power will be cut short. He's the ultimate blasphemy. He's the abomination of desolation prophesied of in Daniel 9, 27. He wars against the saints, against Israel also, we saw from the previous chapter. Those whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life will all at some point worship the beast. And... A lesson about three weeks from now, we'll go over in detail concerning the Lamb's Book of Life. It's an interesting thing to study, but um, for sake of time, we won't go over it today. But the beast will be judged, and he will be destroyed. He will be cast alive into the lake of fire. We see about the false prophet, Revelation 13, 11 through 15. I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. Again, um, this beast is another Gentile beast, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. That's kind of interesting to think of. He's trying to look like he's a good fellow, like he's innocent, like a lamb, but really, he speaks as a dragon, he speaks as his father, the devil, and uh, he... His goal is to work false miracles, false signs, false wonders, and to try to draw people toward the beast. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them that which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire to come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men and deceiveth what them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So this beast works all kinds of demonic signs and wonders. Because there's a sign and a wonder doesn't mean that God did it. Um, there's uh, in this one part of Maryland where my cousins live where a bunch of people, um, like once this one Thursday every so many months or something, I don't know what it is, but a lot of people claim that they have a dream and it's all on the same night of the Virgin Mary coming and visiting them. The devil can work lying signs and wonders. 
He's real. He's out there. And just because there's a sign or a wonder or a dream doesn't mean that it's God who did it. The devil can do these things too. So the, uh, we see that this beast erects an image of the first beast. The false prophet makes an image of the Antichrist and he basically somehow demonically empowers this image so that it speaks and anybody who doesn't worship this image he kills. And his goal is to bring the world to worship the beast. We see concerning the mark of the beast, Revelation 13, 16 through 18, he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, three score, and six. Morning, Paco. How you doing? Um, there's, uh, where's the notes at? Someone get a copy of the notes to Paco, if you would. Um, this is a literal mark, which is placed in the right hand or the forehead. It's uh, basically the de devil's imitation of the seal, which God set in the forehead of the saints several chapters back. So the saints have a mark, so the beast is now going to come up with his imitation mark. And what will be the mark of the beast? Six, six, six. Yep. What is it going to look like? I don't know exactly. What's it going to be? Well, I don't think it's going to be this microchip people are talking about. Because the Bible talks about how the beast, we don't know who he's going to be yet. He's not going to be revealed until after, uh, after the rapture. No one knows who he's going to be till after the rapture. He's not revealed until that point. And um, so I don't think that the exact thing of what the mark of the beast is going to be is going to be revealed. The mark of the beast wasn't Mikhail Gorbachev's weird, funny mark. If those of you who have been alive long enough can remember, people thought it was him. Um, the mark of the beast, um, the beast wasn't Ronald Reagan, despite the fact that his first, middle, and last name all had six numbers in them. Ronald Reagan's dead, so he can't qualify to be the beast. And um, Adolf, Hitler. Adolf Hitler's kind of dead too, so he can't qualify for beastliness. It's definitely the Pope. Um, <laughs> it can't be the Pope because he's someone who won't be revealed until after the tribulation. So it's um, it's a uh, it's a hidden thing. And uh, it won't be the Pope either, as we'll see in Revelation chapter 17. Yeah. Um, it is, this mark of the beast is going to be required. Anybody who's going to try to commit any kind of act of commerce is going to have to use this mark of the beast. Now let's think things through. By this point in the tribulation, a lot of places will have had all their infrastructure destroyed by earthquakes, by plagues, by the pestilences. Most of the ocean-going commerce will have been destroyed. The internet will probably be completely gone from most places by this point. Um, telephone service... Gear could come up with some solutions for those things, though. Che telephone service will be gone from most places. There will be electric service, sewage service, all these things will be gone. So. Here's what's going to be happening is a lot of this, in a lot of places, they're probably going to return to a barter system. Though there will still be places where they'll be able to restore infrastructure to probably the main urban centers. Yes? How do you know all these things are going to be off? Well, you read the, 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 chapters uh, 6 through um, the current time. Read about what's going on, the earthquakes, which just wipe stuff out. They'll talk, it talks about several earthquakes, like one of the earthquakes is so bad that the mountains will be moved out of their places. Um, after Hurricane Katrina in Mississippi, the infrastructure in that fairly small compared to the size of the world area was down for months. And it was months before they had electricity back. And the roads weren't even destroyed. I mean, people could drive in there. It was months before bridges were restored. It was months before all kinds of things were repaired. And I know this because I went and saw the things there. And it was kind of interesting to see. Good morning. Um, so that's why I say that is 
the wide, vast scale of destruction, it's just going to be complete widespread earthwide. A third of the ships will have been sunk. Um, probably two-thirds of the Earth's population will have been killed by this point in the tribulation. So yeah, there's going to be a lot of issues going on. And uh, that's why I say that. Things will probably have in many places returned to a barter system. And for a person to be able to do business, the beast is going to set it up that everyone has to have this mark of the beast in their hand or forehead. Revelation chapter 14 verse 11 prophesies a doom for those who receive it. The Bible says, And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. If a person receives the mark of the beast and worships the image, they're uh, forever doomed. It's almost as if they received the beast as their false savior and they're at that point forever doomed. It becomes the ultimate act of rejection of Christ. They will have seen the lamb at the throne of God. They will have had an angel give a great shout to the whole earth. The, um, those who receive the mark of the beast, they're doing it without excuse. They're doing it uh, knowingly, willfully rejecting Christ. And um, those who receive it and worship the image are doomed forever. Would every person, every person in this generation would have seen evidence of that, hmm? that? Every every person in this generation would have seen it. You're saying would have seen physical evidence of, of Christ. Oh yeah, they, chapter six talks about how they'll look up and they'll see God in heaven, and they'll say to the hills, "Fall on us," and uh, to the rocks, "Cover us." and hide us from the wrath of the Lamb and from him that sitteth on the throne, for who is able to stand? They'll have seen God. And now they're worshiping an alternative. Yeah. That's good. That's awesome. <laughs> the Olivet Discourse, we see uh, Matthew chapter 24 through 25, with uh, cross-references of Mark 13 and Luke 21. I wish we had time to read, just read straight through all four chapters today. Regrettably, we don't. Just had a thought. How long is the average baseball game? About two and a half hours. Two and a half hours. Who likes it when they go into overtime? Because then you get free innings. Extra, extra innings. I love it when they go into extra innings because it's like you get double for your money. Why can't Sunday school be two and a half hours? Amen. That's good, Chris. That's good, Chris. That's I'm awesome. just thinking. That's awesome. Why can't the morning church service be like at least the length of a Super Bowl? I mean, it's of more eternal value than the Super Bowl. Why can't it be the length of the Super Bowl? We've done that. I'm, Ryan says we've done it. We might well have. I, I don't see why it can't be. But anyway, people get mad when it gets over an hour. Sometimes even I get a little bit antsy if I've drank too much coffee, if you'll understand. But, um, <laughs> well, anyway, I just, just random aside thought. The Olivet Discourse, and we see in Matthew chapter 24, verses 1 through 3, the context of the discourse. If you're going to understand the Olivet Discourse, you must understand these verses. And they're very simple, they're very plain. But if you don't pay attention to these verses, you'll get off into weirdly doctrines. Matthew 24, verses 1 through 3. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. So this is shortly before Jesus will die. This is during his final week. He leaves the temple, and the disciples want to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be one left here, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. So the disciples say, this temple's really neat, check it out. And Jesus says, all these stones are going to be thrown down. So the disciples say this. Yeah. Um, and he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately saying, tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? So they have two questions. When's it going to happen? What's the sign of it? 
That's their two questions. When will it happen? What's the sign of it? So Jesus answers their question. Verses um, well, basically, verses 4 through the end of the chapter, and then chapter 25 is Jesus' answer to their question. Um, his answer covers both a near and a far fulfillment. Interestingly, Jesus' answer mirrors Daniel, chapters, or Daniel chapter 9, verses 26 through 27. The near fulfillment will be the destruction of Jerusalem under Titus Flavius in A.D. 70, that is only very minorly figured in this prophecy. I mean, their answer was, when will it be pulled down? Well, that's not really the main focus of what Jesus is interested in telling them. His main focus is an eschatologic emphasis, is a future emphasis. And um, the key to the Olivet Discourse, I have a number of questions here. If we're going to understand the Olivet Discourse, the first question is, what is the eschatologic emphasis of the Gospels. That is, what is the end times emphasis of the Gospels? Who remembers from about six weeks ago? The uh, second coming? The second coming, correct. As opposed to the rapture. So that's something to bear in mind. This is focusing on the second coming. What question is Jesus answering? When the, when the Antichrist is going to come. Answer you the part, uh, uh, what shall be the sign of thy coming? Good answers. What dispensation was this written during? Israel. Israel. An extremely important question to answer there. Uh, whoa, whoa, whoa. How do we know this? When did the uh, church age begin? When Jesus said, I shall build my church? Did he say on this rock, do I build my church or will I build my church? Will I? A uh, future tense verb. So we're in the dispensation of Israel still. Christ has not yet died on the cross. The veil is still in place. Access to God is still through the priestly system set up by God through Moses, the way God had ordained for people to approach him during this dispensation. Yes. To, I mean, we're, we're talking about Jesus going into the temple right now. Yeah. Yeah, we're talking about Jesus going in the temple. Jesus was in the temple. He, uh, he followed the Old Testament law. Jesus was the ultimate example of following the Old Testament law. He never broke one little bit of it. That's good. And, uh, That's good, Chris. That's awesome. Anyway, awesome. we see in... Um, Another question is, whom is God dealing with and working through this passage? Israel or the church? The obvious answer is Israel, yes. During which of week of Daniel's 70 weeks are these events going to be prophesied of, going to be taken place? The answer is it's Daniel's 70th week. I'm answering it for sake of time because uh, we're running shy. Daniel's 70th week, it's not in the intermission. This passage does not deal with the intermission between Daniel's 69th and 70th week. Um, this, which is the church age, this uh, passage deals with Daniel's 70th week, the Great Tribulation. And uh, the question, of course, is with whom is God dealing in the Tribulation? Israel or the church? Well, it's Israel. The church is in heaven during the Tribulation. So that's just some questions to ponder. It's the key to the Olivet Discourse, if you'll understand those things. And Jesus begins with a warning concerning deceivers and about persecutions to come. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. It's a good thing to begin this line with. Take heed that no man deceive us and give us false doctrine concerning these things. People come up by bad interpretations of Matthew 24 and start to say things like, um, the rapture is going to be in, what's the newest prediction? Well, May 21st, 2011. May 21st, 2011. I think it's Harold Campy or somebody saying that. <laughs> it's like, he's been prophesying that since the 80s, and if anybody listens to him, they're crazy. But um, he's been wrong since then, and someone who's wrong since then, I guess maybe they're hoping he'll eventually be right. But um, every, I remember when I was young, there was this one South Korean guy who was saying that... Uh, 
the rapture was fixing to happen and he gave a certain day and like the day before he got imprisoned for like somehow fraudulently messing with bonds or something he was trying to fetch all his money up I guess he wanted to spend it all before the tribulation came because the Antichrist would probably hive it up anyway. I don't know. At least he believed his own prophecy, but then it turned out that it didn't happen, and I wasn't surprised. But uh, take heed that no man deceive you. He goes on then to talk about there's going to be false Christs, false prophets, and he then describes how there's going to be wars, rumors of wars, famines, pestilence, and earthquakes, but... Uh, these aren't the signs that he's going to be coming. Um, they're just going to be there. Um, they're going to be there. They'll be bad when they happen, but this isn't the sign. Persecutions will arise and many will hate each other. The love of many will wax cold. Again, this isn't the sign. This is all the time. People who think things are bad now, I mean, and, and modern Christians think things are really bad right now, because we remember in somewhat distant past a time when of great revival, which can still come, and um, I hope that you're praying actively for revival to come. If you're not, you need to be. If you don't believe that God can still revive his people, um, then, uh, well, you need to study his word, what it says in James 4.8. Well, uh, people have always been wicked. Study ancient Greece. If you read a play written by Aristophanes, hopefully you don't, but if you read one of them, you'll be scandalized by the filthy things he wrote. You think modern TV's bad? Those Greek plays, a lot of them were horrible. I mean, they, they put to shame modern TV. Um, think ancient times are bad? Read, read Plutarch's lives and see how the Romans and Greeks behaved. It wasn't very good. The uh, Canaanites. There's a reason God wanted them exterminated, and they were very bad. Very bad. So, um... Modern people don't have the corner on badness. Yes. yes. But Jesus is answering the question, what shall be the sign? Well, if we see in, uh, let me read it for you in particular. Because he's going to answer in a bit what shall be the sign. He says um, in verse 6, And ye shall hear wars and rumors of wars, and ye sit... And see that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Is not yet. So, verse so, 29 is the answer in that passage. So ye in like manner, when ye shall see these things come to pass, know that it is not even at the doors. And verily I say unto you that this generation shall not pass till these things be done, is, is that verse. And so what he's saying is, what, he, what that passage of Scripture is actually teaching is the imminence of the coming of Christ. There has never been anything that has needed to take place in order for Christ to return since the resurrection. And, it, and the, the command in the scripture is for every generation, and the promise is to every generation, that it's going to be your generation that Christ returns in. And so, I mean, the, 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 verse 29, I think, is the answer to that question. We'll see concerning the sign also. Jesus describes the Son of Man in the, sun, in the sky. What's the sign of the Son of Man coming? Well, that he's there. That's the sign he gives. We'll see in a few verses down. Um, the love of many will wax cold. People have always been wicked. This is going to characterize the sins of mankind, and uh, that's how it's always been, unfortunately. When people grow away from God, they get progressively worse. But um, things right now really aren't that bad. America is a pretty safe nation you think things are bad here if you think things are wicked here um go to a nation which is lawless even just go south of the border of mexico and uh see how well you like it i've been there it's kind of scary being there um go to a nation where law is by bribe and um if you think things are bad here see how it works and uh, you'd be amazed visit a third world country well we see uh, the Antichrist will enter the holy place of the temple. This is verses, I skipped ahead of myself, verses 15 through 28. We see the Antichrist enters the holy place of the temple, violating his seven-year agreement with Israel. This is the abomination of desolation. This is the three-and-a-half-year point 
of the tribulation. What's the sign that it's going to be coming? Well, the Antichrist shows up. That's the sign of the destruction of the temple. The Antichrist shows up and the temple gets destroyed. Um, he, uh, well, basically desecrates the temple. The temple will be rebuilt in the beginning of the, well, at some point in the beginning of the tribulation. The temple will be rebuilt and the Antichrist is going to come and destroy it. In concern to uh, the phrase, the love of many will wax cold, this could perhaps be in a reference to uh, the fact that the people's agreement they make with Israel is going to be broken and no one's going to like the Jews at all and they're going to be chased and destroyed by the Antichrist. Um, but the ultimate point to remember, though, is that uh, the focus of this passage isn't on this current age. It's on the age to come. We're in the church age. We're not in the age of Israel, which is going to return. Um, God will work again with Israel during the tribulation. But uh, the second half of the tribulation is then described in uh, Matthew chapter 24, verses 21 through 28. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of this time. No, nor shall ever be. And then there's a warning about, uh, you know, the things which will be going on then. And the uh, deceit and the false prophets which will be coming. People saying that uh, Christ is here, lo, Christ is there. Well, they're... Uh, well, remember the warning did not be deceived. These false Christs, there'll be many apparently, one great false Christ. These uh, false Christs, they're not, people shouldn't be deceived by them. And the uh, Jews who will be reading Matthew at this time, here's a warning for them not to be deceived. If you're wondering why we sang the song, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, it's because of Matthew chapter 24. In particular, verses 15 through 22, in the great tribulation which Israel will be put through by Antichrist. The uh, Jews have been persecuted by the devil throughout ages. Um, the most particular great recent persecution was when Hitler destroyed six million Jews. And um, people are trying to say that the Holocaust never happened, which is just crazy, but uh, it shows the devil's hatred against Jews, and um, that's why we sang that song. But anyway, um, it's a neat song, and I hope we get to sing it again soon. The tribulation during the second half worsens exceedingly in intensity, both in the judgments and because of the beast. The judgments in the second half, we're going to see next week, the vile judgments. They're extremely bad in comparison with the previous ones. And then the beast starts really uh, cranking things up against the Christians and against the Jews, and uh, many are killed. The second coming itself, verses 29 through 35. And there shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. What's the sign? The Son of Man appears in heaven. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heaven to the other. This is not the rapture. When the rapture happens, it will be sudden, it will be instantaneous. The Christians will be gone, it will be in a moment, it will be a twinkling of an eye. It is not this great glorious appearing, they're different. Related, yet different. And... Um, it says in verse 32, Now learn the parable of the fig tree, when his branch is yet tender, and putteth forth his leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when ye shall see these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. A lot of people said, May our, oh, I forget the date, but something, 1948, the date of Israel's foundation, that was the generation. And Christ is going to return within 70 years of May 1948. No. 
didn't happen. Well, actually, it hasn't quite been 70 years yet, but it won't happen. Has it? Someone do some quick math for me. 2018? Thank you. Good job. So we know it's not 2011. So it's definitely not 2011. Well, a lot of people say, well, maybe generation is only 40 years. That's what people were saying back in the 80s. Generation's only 40 years. Christ's about to return. Didn't happen. So then they decided to deposit it at um, uh, the date of victor Israel's victories in the Yom Kippur War in 1967, I believe. And that obviously hasn't happened within 40 years. Christ could return at any point and it won't be related to that. Um, one, this generation won't pass away refers to, that's uh, the next verse. So likewise, you. Um, so verily, verily, I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. God's going to keep his people, the Jews, safe. They're not going to be destroyed. When you see these things, what things? Well, the Antichrist coming. That's the thing he's referring to. When you see these things, well, the people being destroyed, persecuted, all the false Christ and especially the great false Christ coming. When you see these things, well, the Son of Man appearing in heaven with his, an with his angels. When you see these things doesn't refer to the fact that the uh, Levites think they might have found a red heifer. Doesn't refer to the fact that the Jews are already ready to rebuild the temple. They've got the materials in place. They've got the stuff in place. They've got everything ready. They do, by the way. They have this big, giant temple committee with bowls and snuffer dishes and lavers and altars and everything except the Ark of the Covenant, which they say they have, but no one's seen. Um, they have all these things ready, but this isn't the sign that Christ is going to return. It's critical for Christians to understand the doctrine of the imminence of the return of Christ, and that is that it could happen at any point. Which brings us to our next point. Uh, Matthew chapter 24, verse 36 through 25, 46. Say, Mr. Chris, how are we going to get through a chapter and a half in, in negative two minutes because we're over time? <laughs> we won't, but just like uh, the people were suddenly destroyed at the time of Noah, so uh, sudden destruction will be coming upon the wicked. No one, it says, can predict the time of the second coming. At that point, Jesus told his disciples, No man knoweth the day or the hour of the second coming is what's in reference. By inference of that, we don't know the day or the hour of the rapture either. No one knows when these things are going to come. And there's a command to watch. And uh, Matthew 24, 42, Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. And uh, the church doesn't know when the Lord will come. Israel what, won't know exactly what hour the Lord will be coming. But there will be a command for them to be ready. And Matthew 24, 44 through 47 talks about rewards for those who are ready. Um, 24, 48 through 51 talks about um, unreadiness is going to be judged. And uh, the point in readiness is one, being ready by way of salvation. Two, being ready by way of being right with the Lord by being active in service. Matthew chapter 25 has three parables concerning readiness, the ten virgins, the three servants, and the sheep and the goats. These sermons, these, I mean, uh, parables all describe readiness, being ready for the second coming. There is a group which was ready. There is a group which wasn't. The group which is ready was rewarded. The group which wasn't was judged. And that's about all we can say about it because we're out of time. But, um, uh, Chris, yes. I have a question again. So if we're commanded to watch and we're not supposed to take any of the signs as a sign of that his return could be near, I know it's always been imminent, then what are we watching for? For his return. We're not watching for signs, we're watching for a return. What we as the church are watching for is uh, Thessalonians, uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 17, the sudden snatching up. But he did rebuke the Pharisees for not knowing the signs of the times. I mean, they didn't even know, you know, they weren't in tune with Jesus coming the first time. Well, they weren't. And there are clear signs prophesied for that. But then he told them this, An evil and an adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. There shall no be sign be given unto this generation, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. And I would say the same thing is true for the church today. 
And it's an evil and uh, idolatrous church which seeks after signs. People want signs, but the sign is, is we'll be gone. Yes? The interesting thing is that there is, there is a parallel doctrine that's being taught instead of the doctrine that we need to pay attention to. The doctrine of eminence is so parallel with the signs of the times that the signs of the times prove that Christ can return at any time. That's the conclusion of Matthew chapter 13. But what we do instead is, is we start to look, instead of looking for Christ, we're looking for signs. The Antichrist. And we're looking for the Antichrist. Yeah, and that and that's the big that's the major distraction in prophecy today. You look at any prophecy conference, any prophecy teaching, and it's all about the signs of the times, but it's not about Christ. And that's what twenty nine says. When it says, uh, or verse 29 of Matthew, or Mark 13, So ye, in like manner, when ye shall see these things come to pass, know that it is nigh even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be done. And then heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. But, and here's the answer, of that day and that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son but the Father. So in answer to that question, is angels in heaven can watch for the signs of the time and God in heaven is the one that knows. Take heed, watch, and pray for you. Know not what the time, when the time is. That's the answer. Take heed, watch, and pray. What I say unto you, I say unto you all, watch. And that's the answer to the disciples is watch. So we're spo it's not a command not to look. But everybody keeps looking at the signs of the time and glorifying these events of the world, which are just all pictures of what Christ can do. But they're not looking at Christ. And that's that's more doctrine of eminence. In Mark 13, verse 27, is that talking about the rapture there? Then shall he send his angels and shall gather up uh, together his elect from the four winds, even from the uttermost part of uh, the earth to the uttermost part of heaven? Or that's the second coming? That's the second coming. That's the regathering of Israel. Um, it is uh, distinct from the rapture. Yeah. This is two characters who are definitely not the beast and false prophet, if that narrows things down a little for you. These are possibly the two witnesses. And uh, with that, we'll be dismissed, and we'll see you all next week.